Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Eric and I love to teach and present information in the simplest form for you to understand. I do this with short animated clinical videos. In today's video, I will teach you everything you need to know about statins. By the end of this video, you'll become very confident in managing patients on statins, or even if you're a patient watching this video, you will also get to learn a lot about your medication. So if you love my teaching style, if you learn at least one thing during this video, then hit the like button and subscribe for more. Thank you. Statins are drugs that lower cholesterol. They achieve this by inhibiting the enzyme hydroxymethylglutarate-CoA reductase, aka HMG-CoA reductase. With this inhibition, we get the cholesterol lowering effect. Cholesterol has such a bad reputation, but it's actually an important substance for the body. In general, cholesterol is a waxy, fat-like lipid substance. Let's assume it looks like this. As mentioned earlier, cholesterol serves many functions. The body uses cholesterol to maintain integrity of the cell membranes. So here's a picture of a cell membrane. And remember, cell membranes have this lipid bilayer. These are all made up of lipids and cholesterol. Next, cholesterol is used to produce hormones like stress hormones and sex hormones. It's used to produce vitamin D. And lastly, it's part of the bile that is needed to digest your food. With all of these essential functions, of cholesterol. Am I saying that you should go eat a ton of eggs so you can get all the cholesterol from the yolk? Uh, no. That's because your liver makes majority of the cholesterol in your body. This is really the only cholesterol that you need. Excess cholesterol comes from food. This is not really needed. That is why the cholesterol from food should come from the healthiest sources and also you don't have too much of it. So we have two main sources of cholesterol. At the same time, there are two main types of cholesterol. Since cholesterol is lipid soluble, it cannot just float around in the blood. This is incorrect. Instead, it's carried around by a special vehicle called a lipoprotein. A lipoprotein is made up of proteins and fats. It's produced by the liver and the main function is to transport lipids, fats, cholesterol through the blood. There are different types of lipoproteins. In general, they are divided based on their lipid and protein composition. Lipoproteins are larger and less dense when the fat to protein ratio is high. The first type is the chylomicron, which is composed of mostly triglycerides and very little protein. Over 90% of it is triglycerides. Chylomicrons carry triglycerides from the intestines to the liver, to skeletal muscles, and to adipose tissue. Next, we have the VLDL, or very low density lipoprotein, which is also triglyceride rich. VLDL carries newly synthesized triglycerides from the liver to adipose tissues. Next is LDL. LDL cholesterol is derived from VLDL. So they have some triglyceride, but they also contain a good amount of cholesterol. LDL carries the majority of the cholesterol that is in the circulation. LDL consists of a spectrum of particles varying in sizes and density. So you may have heard of small dense LDL and large dense LDL particles with the small ones being more likely to accumulate in the blood vessel walls because they have a decreased affinity for the LDL receptors, so they just stay in the blood. This can lead to atherosclerosis, which is a buildup of fats, cholesterol, in your arteries. This causes the vessels to become narrow and it decreases the blood flow to vital organs. This plaque can build up and also break off and move to smaller blood vessels blocking them, which can unfortunately lead to heart attacks and strokes. Finally, we have HDL, which is enriched in cholesterol because it picks up all this cholesterol from the peripheral tissues and return it to the liver to be broken down. HDL particles also contain antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, anti-thrombotic, and anti-apoptotic capabilities, which may help explain why they can prevent atherosclerosis. So when we look at the different types of cholesterol, don't include the chylomicrons and VLDL, since they are triglyceride rich. LDL and HDL lipoproteins are the ones that have a lot of cholesterol, and these are the two main types of cholesterol. LDL being the bad cholesterol, and HDL being the good cholesterol. 
cholesterol. So the mechanism of action of statins influences both the LDL and the HDL, and it starts with the liver. As mentioned earlier, your body makes over 80% of its cholesterol, so then that's exactly what we want to target the body's cholesterol. Cholesterol synthesis begins with acetyl-CoA, which gets converted to HMG-CoA. This is catalyzed by HMG-CoA synthase. Then HMG-CoA to melvalonate, and this is catalyzed by HMG-CoA reductase. This is followed by a series of reactions, which ultimately lead to the end product's cholesterol. The rate limiting step in this reaction, meaning the slowest step and the one that determines the rate of the overall reaction, is the conversion of the HMG-CoA to the melvalonate, and that is what statins targets through competitive inhibition. In competitive inhibition, it means that statins look exactly as the active molecule that normally will bind to the HMG-CoA reductase to fuel this reaction. In this case, the statins and that molecule compete for the same active binding sites. When the statins bind, it leads to a drug enzyme complex, and that prevents the active molecule from binding, and also this binding seizes the reaction and prevents conversion of the HMG-CoA to mevalonate. By reducing hepatic cholesterol synthesis, an upregulation of hepatic LDL receptors occurs, leading to an increased hepatic uptake of LDL DL cholesterol to be broken down. Because there are a series of reactions or compounds that are impacted by the inhibition of the HMG-CoA reductase, before we get to the end product, cholesterol, statins are known to have what we call pleiotropic effects, which simply means that it produces more than one effect. So let's see this again. After inhibiting HMG-CoA reductase, melvalonates will decrease, and that will cause something else to decrease. And then another thing, and then another thing, until we finally get to cholesterol. One group of notable compounds that are inhibited due to the HMG-CoA reductase inhibition are known as isoprenoids, which are responsible for activating some intracellular signaling proteins. Example of some of these proteins are RHO and RAS, which in normal circumstances promotes inflammation, cell proliferation, and cell migration, all of which will add onto the progression of atherosclerosis and other vascular disorders. So because the production of RHO and RAS are also inhibited by these statins, they have these effects other than the cholesterol reducing effects. Studies have actually shown that statins decrease plaque volume independent of the LDL cholesterol reduction. This pleiotropic effect is a class effect of statins and this is demonstrated by all statins. Here's a list of the common statins in practice, and here is a synopsis of the FDA-approved indications. I do not want to focus too much on the disease states, since this video is really about learning all about these statins. So let's look into the pharmacokinetics of these agents. So in other words, what the body does to the drug. I have a video on pharmacokinetic, great for beginners, link is right above. So let's discuss the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of these agents. In terms of the absorption rate, absorption is faster for the lipophilic drugs like atorvastatin, simvastatin, fluvastatin, pitavastatin, and lovastatin than hydrophilic statins like rosuvastatin or pravastatin. As we know, protein binding affects drug distribution and the pharmacological efficacy of drugs because only the unbound or a free drug can elicit targeted effects. All statins have a high plasma protein binding, except for pravastatin. CYP384 plays a crucial role in the metabolism of atorvastatin, lovastatin, and simvastatin. For CYP2C9, it's fluvastatin, pitavastatin, and to a lesser degree, rosuvastatin, which is also metabolized by 2C19. Lastly, PGP substrates include atorvastatin, lovastatin, and simvastatin. These agents are also inhibitors of the P glycoprotein. I have a video on the CYP enzymes drug interaction, and also another one on the P glycoprotein drug interactions, link above. In general, the statins are excreted through the urine and feces, 
In terms of the half-life, the ones with a short half-life are fluvastatin, lovastatin, pravastatin, and simvastatin. Because of this, these agents are recommended to be taken at night, and this is because during the nighttime is when there is a peak in the cholesterol synthesis, so then we want the drug to be in the body during this time. So if the half-life is short and you take it during the day, then by the nighttime when you need it the most, it will be all out of the body. Statins with long half-life includes atorvastatin, pitavastatin and rosuvastatin. These agents can be taken at any time of the day, but the uh, administration should be at the same time of the day. Aside from these PK nuances that can drive clinical decisions, statins also have dose intensity recommendations based on the estimated LDL level reductions. So here's a table depicting that. We have different statins in the first column and then the different dose intensities with its associated dosing recommendations in the subsequent columns. This is from the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. In short, statin intensity refers to how powerful a statin is. Every statin has different doses available. Generally, the higher your doses, the more they lower LDL cholesterol. Although we know that the higher statin intensity the better they work, we must also know that they may come with more side effects. By the way, if you're enjoying this video so far, then please destroy that like button so that the YouTube algorithm can kick in and others can see it. Thank you. Nearly all of the statin drugs are associated with musculoskeletal side effects. This side effect is dose dependent and the reported rate ranges from 0.3 to 33%. The most common form of the musculoskeletal side effect is myalgia or muscle aches, and then a more severe form, myositis or muscle inflammation, and then even more serious and life-threatening, rhabdomyolysis. Both myositis and rhabdomyolysis are accompanied by a rise in the serum creatinine kinase, an enzyme that's normally found in the muscles. Rhabdomyolysis has a much higher increase in the creatinine kinase, plus associated features include myoglobinuria, renal impairment, and electrolyte abnormalities. Myoglobin is a protein found in the muscles, so this shows up in the urine in patients with rhabdomyolysis. The exact mechanism is unknown and it's not well understood, but it may be due to the decreased synthesis of melvalonate, which in turn will reduce certain enzymes like CoQ10, which is needed for production of energy in muscle cells. Statins have also been shown to alter cholesterol content in the skeletal muscle cells, which alters the flow of iron channels, including calcium, making them more vulnerable to cell injury and death. In terms of managing these side effects, some studies found a reduction in the statin-associated muscle symptoms when patients received CoQ10 supplementation, and these were small studies, so we still need larger studies to confirm this. The other option is to switch to a different agent, give a lower dose, or administer it every other day while monitoring the patients for symptoms and creatinine kinase levels as needed. In cases when the patient has rhabdomyolysis, the recommendation is clear. With Draw the statin and do not administer or rechallenge with another statin in the future. Statin therapy can affect the liver. These agents have been associated with asymptomatic elevated hepatic transaminases in up to 1 to 3% of patients. This is usually dose dependent and occurs within the first three months of commencing therapy and is not usually associated with any long term hepatic dysfunction. In terms of the mechanism associated with this, it has been surmised that the etiology may be the result of changes in the hepatocyte lipid membranes leading to an increase in permeability and the leakage of liver enzymes. Although it is useful to obtain baseline hepatic function prior to initiation, routine monitoring of liver function tests is not recommended. In the presence of elevated transaminases, continuation of the statin is okay with closed monitoring. This elevation is usually a transient effect and it resolves with continued therapy or a brief therapy interruption. Now, if patient develops signs and symptoms of liver injury, the statin should be discontinued. Once there is a resolution of the acute injury, 
state, use of a different statin can be considered. Another side effect associated with statin usage is new onset diabetes. This is a dose dependent side effects and the incidence varies across trials. As high as 25% increase in new onset of diabetes has been seen in trials contrast to placebo. The new onset of diabetes has been found to be more common in patients who already had risk factors for diabetes or were pre-diabetic. The mechanism behind this is a disruption of insulin signaling pathways and contribute to insulin resistance. Overall, the cardiovascular protective benefits of statins outweigh the concerns associated with the risk of developing diabetes. So in terms of the management of this, it is important that patients are informed of this risk prior to commencing therapy and routine monitoring of the blood glucose levels is recommended. Other side effects of statins include headaches. This side effect may resolve on its own once your body is used to the medication. Statins may also cause fatigue, GI problems, including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, and flatulence. Lastly, there has been some concern regarding cognitive dysfunction in patients on long-term statin therapy. These generally consist of mild forms of forgetfulness, confusion, and inability to process and understand certain information. But a recent systematic review did not find any overall increased risk of dementia with long-term statin use. Now, a good way to remember some of these side effects is with the mnemonic Lipitor. Lipitor is the brand name for atorvastatin. So L is for liver, so the increase in the transaminases. I for increased blood glucose, P for pain, the other I is for impaired memory, T for tiredness, right, fatigue, O refers to the other side effects like headache and GI symptoms, and R is for rhabdomyolysis. Before I bring this video to an end, let's learn about some of the clinical pearls and interesting things about statins. So in summary, statins in trials have shown a reduction in LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, mortality, and increase the HDL cholesterol. Next, statins should generally be avoided in pregnancy and breastfeeding mothers. Although in 2021, the FDA actually requested removal of the contraindication against statin use in pregnancy. And this is because when you say something is a contraindication, it means there's absolutely no use for it in that particular scenario. But because the benefits of statins may include prevention of serious or potentially fatal events in a small group of very high-risk pregnant patients, contraindicating these drugs in all pregnant women is not not appropriate. Next, statins may require renal hepatic dose adjustment, so always want to assess for this. And also, statins can be taken with or without food. Finally, there are some retrospective studies that have concluded that there is an association between statins and reduced cancer risk, lower cancer grade and stage at diagnosis, and reduced reoccurrence and or cancer-specific mortality. This is because the mevalonate pathway supports tumorigenesis and is known to be dysregulated in human cancers and statins have been shown to induce potent tumor-specific apoptosis. For now, more studies are required for further recommendations by FDA and other guidelines. And that will bring this video to an end. Hope I did my best in explaining this topic for you to understand and you're now a little bit more comfortable with statins. If this video was helpful, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share this video with someone who could benefit from it. Also follow me on these social media platforms. Thank you and take care.